Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week from Australia, Carol Cook. Carol, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. Oh, we're going to have some fun here. So let's <laughs> let's just start with the book because the book is the key to everything here. I think um, improv embroidery, and uh, it's it's a project book, but it's not a project book because it's not a bunch of pages of of diagrams and charts that you just copy. Um, it's suggestions and ideas for how to go about creating your own work. Um, what uh, t- Tell us how this got started. Well, I, th- I think it started, um, I've always made things. I've always been making various crafts, had a long time doing quilts, and but I felt that I didn't have a particular direction and I did, certainly didn't feel I was making art. I was making using craft to make craft objects. Um, and I'd always wanted to go to university and it was through university studies that I began to understand that you could use a craft to complete an artwork and make social and political comment if you wanted to, which was obviously encouraged at university. And it was there that I became more confident in learning the basics of a whole range of things that were introduced to us at university but it was the embroidery that caught my attention um, while I was taught various textile techniques in all sorts of areas. Uh, it was the embroidery that I picked up and became more confident with. We folk in the States here uh, tend to uh, buy projects and um, copy them, you know, execute yeah. them. And yep. w- once we start talking to people outside of the States, we get the reverse. Uh, you guys, you guys tend to create and, uh, but, but you craft. And, and there's nothing wrong with following a commercial no. pattern, um, yeah. which obviously is, is extremely popular. If you look at the books, uh, books will have an introduction and then they'll have the patterns at the back and you draft those patterns and you follow the instructions. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's a way of learning techniques. It's a way of completing a project perhaps um, and giving you confidence. But when I started teaching after I'd completed at university, a lot of, of course, a lot of my my students are going to be older because um, they're able to get to classes. And they seem to be almost scarred by the needlework, I guess you'd call it, that they had done in school years. Uh, there were strict rules. It was draconian. It was um, uh, very strict. You had to be extremely neat. And it seemed that many of those teachers were fairly negative in their response to what these women had done. So they were actually quite scarred. And when I said that you can do this and you can do what you'd like, it was really quite an eye-opener for them. And they they felt almost relieved that they could do what they want and I wasn't going to slap the back of their hand. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes I think you get to a point with commercial patterns You can do them, but maybe for some people, they want to branch out, but they don't quite know how. And I hope that this book gives people that chance to go on their own and feel confident about it, not scared, because it's not a scary process. It's a very easy process. Um, And it was through the teaching that people, and also a major work that I'd done, and people said, how did you do that? That I thought I'd sit down and write what was my process. And so the book came from that. Yeah. You said at the beginning there, using craft to make art. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was an interesting distinction because we we tend to avoid the word craft because I like to view needlework as art no matter how you execute it because it it really is much more than, you know, craft kind of puts it into that women's work type category, which, yuck, we don't want that. We want it to... We want art. We want creativity. So, you, yeah. so that's an interesting uh, thought process. Craft to make art. Yeah, and I, I think the 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 discussion on craft versus art could go on for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and when you look up on the internet the definition of it, I think there is a clear definition. I think craft is learning the technique. In this case, it happens to be embroidery stitches. But it turns into art when you start to make 
uh, political comment, social comment, environmental comment, or you're taking it from the traditional and turning it into some, it, it, reinventing it into some other form. Uh, for example, some of my embroidery is three-dimensional um, and there are three-dimensional stitches and three-dimensional techniques, uh, but I developed another way of, of getting the embroidery off the cloth and taking it to a three-dimensional uh, end product, making comment on a variety of things, such as in my examples were memory, for example. Um, and so I think there is a definition between the two um, and it shouldn't be women's work. You know, it's no doubt about that. That's, that's a way of putting people down uh, very easily. Um, but it is a craft. We are, I think we are using a craft to, to move on. And through this book, you start to move on into art pieces. Yeah, no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah, that's what I liked about the book. Is <laughs> we're do, doing more than just uh, just executing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but but that's so when you when you go to people and who who've been chastised for not doing things right for years, and say you don't have to do that. Here's some freedom. Uh, so you, you generally get a positive reaction, but is there a fear? Is there a hesitation? There's certainly a hesitation because I think that we remember back to our childhood and, and a teacher has such power over children because you read stories where Mrs Smith said something to you in a class and from that positive um, feedback, you might become a doctor or you might become an artist. But I think in the old days, teachers um, often were quite strict and quite mean um, I hope they're not like that now. I think they're they're about um, being positive and hoping that you'll move forward. Um, but but they are nervous and they're worried about it. And um, it takes a fair bit of reassurance to actually say to them, you know what, that looks great. Um, you know, I w I went recently to an exhibition uh, of the is 150 years of the Royal School of Embroidery in Britain. And they had a piece there, an embroidery piece. It was absolutely beautiful, but it was exactly the same on the back as it was on the front. Of course, technically, that's wonderful, but the stress of trying to do that, even thinking about it, made me sweat. Um, so <laughs> I, I think that those rules need to be left behind, unless you want to aim for that. And, of course, the Royal School of Needlework still goes, and they follow some very strict rules, and they create beautiful, beautiful pieces. Um, but I'm really more about also not just the embroidery, but your thought process and where you are mentally while you're doing it which is why I talk about not necessarily making anything to display, but rather making something and be in the moment while you're doing it. Yeah, and I found that interesting because you commented that that came out several times in your book, that you're not, in the social media age, we tend to think, okay, should I, you know, do I post this on Instagram? Do I post this on Facebook? But instead of, you know, you kind of insinuated, no, that's not why you're doing this. You know, it doesn't have to be Insta-perfect. This is absolutely, and and, and I I um, I'm actually writing another book, and I have a whole chapter on perfection because I remember making a quilt many many years ago for a young woman who was uh, uh, she was Jewish and she was going to her bat mitzvah, and I made her a quilt for that celebration, and I read that one of their teachings was that only God is perfect, and they actually through their culture they preferred you to make something and put a mistake into it. And I thought that was lovely. To Why are we trying to aim for perfection? Humans are not perfect. And I think that that holds you back because you look at it and maybe you undo it and then maybe you get frustrated and maybe you don't continue on. And I think you should be happy with every stitch that you put down. And there is a big difference between critiquing your work and criticising it. And that's something that I always emphasise. Of course, you can look at a piece you've made particularly as I do a lot of samples and say, I like that part and I like that part. This is a section that I think I can improve on or I can change to fit my positive um, thinking on it. The, the book looks at, um, at, at the, the art, but it, it's, there's so much of it is is just a, a free form embroidery, um, uh, just 
in a lot of ways, I, I feel like you're, you just, just start and yep. just don't, you know, even if you don't have a plan, just kind of let it come out of you. Absolutely. There is a, one of the, t one of the classes that I teach is to give people a piece of cloth and we learn some very simple stitches and we, I, I say to people, let's cover it. And the, the nice thing about the embroidery is that it's also not very expensive because you need a little bit of thread, a good needle and scissors and some cloth. And you take your stitches and begin to maybe use some of the commercial pattern or flow on the on the piece you're using and just start to fill it. And some people say, well, when do I know I'm finished? And I, I always tell them I'm finished when I can't get the needle through the cloth anymore because <laughs> I start to layer other stitches on top of other stitches and colour, and I almost make it so thick that it's it's uh, no longer um, able to go so I can move on to another one. So it's finished when you've had enough of it as well. I mean, that's an interesting question that people go, when, when is it finished? Um, and my mother taught me a wonderful saying. She said, it's best to sleep on it. And the thought is that if you're not sure about your work or your direction or whether it's finished or not finished, pop it onto a viewing wall, leave it alone, go away, have a good sleep and come back with fresh eyes. And it's amazing how you can go, oh, I can see a gap here, I could add a bit more there, or I'm done with it and move on to the next piece of fabric. Yeah. Did you come from a creative it, family? No, not really. Um, my mum was a nurse and she I think she knitted a bit I do recall her knitting certainly didn't stitch anything my grandmother was definitely not uh, creative at all for, for handcraft um, so and on my father's side I don't think they my female relatives did anything either so I think it was just a passion I was born with <laughs> you're the genetic anomaly then <laughs> that's right I had a twin brother and funnily enough he he became creative in his late 50s um, as well. And it was just staggering that we both took on a creative path. He writes poetry, um, and you might have noticed some of his poetry uh, in the book, uh, where he would respond to my work or I would respond to his. So we work together from time to time talking about particular issues, and he'll respond with words, and then I'll respond with stitch. And it's a very nice partnership. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Wow. And you said something in your book about um, like being in the moment. So do you do you like listen to music while you're stitching or um, a book or, or do you like just silent? <clears throat> I'm actually work with total silence. Now, uh, I'm, I live in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia, and we call it the bush capital. That's its sort of nickname. Um, and so there are a lot of birds, although I live in what I'd call a suburban area, there are a lot of birds carrying on outside. We have very noisy birds in Australia, and that's enough noise for me. Listening to <laughs> what's going on in the trees is enough. I'm really thinking about the process, and I'm, I do um, promote and recommend that my students have a journal. So if a, if a profound idea floats into my head it's clearly not going to stay there for long as I get older so I do write things down um, and I record I have many journals with notes that I can refer back to but I, I do prefer to work in silence even though some of the work is repetitive I might be doing many many um, French knots for example but I'm still thinking about the process and where I might take that yeah, you, you really are a proponent of the uh, write it down, sketch it out uh, process. You, must, you say you have several journal books. I, that was the impression I got from the book was you must have stacks of them. Just uh, your, make sure those ideas get, ideas get recorded so you don't, they're not lost. Absolutely. I have two bookshelves in my studio and one is for other people's textbooks and one is for my journals. I started journal making. It was something that we were taught to do at university Honestly, I didn't understand the process at the time. I'd put things in and I, I just didn't understand why I was being even asked to do it. And I get that students do ask. But you do also need a break from needlework. And I think sketching out some patterns, drawing a simple flower or even a petal or a shape can then get you thinking about that. And then from that shape, you can think, how would I adapt that to some simple stitching? 
Um, and I do actually ask my students to, to put their pen on their paper <laughs> and I hear a variety of groans, but I can't draw. But that's just not true. I can't embroider, I can't paint, I can't draw. It's, it's an absolute fallacy because if you haven't put your pen on your paper, that's why you can't draw. And I think it's just about practice and getting in the zone and not caring what people think. Of course, we all draw rubbish when we first start, but you have to practice. Like any, any craft or art, I doubt a very many of us are so incredible that we just pick it up and start. Any of the samples in my book have come about from 20 samples before that. There are boxes of them because I practice and I critique the work and then I have a clearer idea as to what I want to do. And 90% of the things in this book are just samples. They're not for display. They haven't been framed. They're not up for sale. They're in a Tupperware box and they were made for the pleasure of making. They weren't made to put into an exhibition, although obviously when I'm teaching, I use them for teaching. Yeah, yeah see, that was, I think that's the part I enjoyed the most about the book is – is you, you go through the whole thing and it, you know, there's nothing there that you would look at and say, oh, I have to frame that or I have to put that in a in a uh, coffee table, something or other. Uh, it's Absolutely. Just, it, you're just, it's just expression and uh, yeah, there's a freedom there, yes. And, and I think that that notion of having to make something or having to put it onto social media has to be addressed uh, you, you don't have to make it for anyone other than for yourself and for the joy of making, the joy of creating and the joy of being in a place of meditation. I mean, I, I have a wonderful, wonderful husband and partner. And when I would make things, he, he used to say, doesn't say it now, but he used to say, what's it for? And I thought that was a very interesting question. It's actually not for anything. We don't have to make to display or to share. And and if you have girlfriends that look at your work and go, oh, don't like that, then don't show it or get new girlfriends. Um, <laughs> but this is purely for self. And, and I know that I think that the younger people have worked out they do everything for themselves. And I think the older generation needs to say, I am giving myself the time. I'm doing this because I enjoy it. And really, I don't care what you think. And that's quite a hard thing to do because you might take it up and show it to your husband and he's sitting there looking at it and it's a complete mystery. My husband's an engineer. He doesn't understand what I do, but he supports it 100%. So, and I think you need to understand there are different personalities, but you have to get it into your mindset that this is just for you. And how nice is that if you give yourself the time? It's a gift, isn't it? And we don't do it very often. My, right. hu my husband's an engineer. Beth, meet Carol. Carol, meet Beth. <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine always is like, so, so um, can you sell it? And I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being sold. You know, no one can afford it with the amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I have to say, though, as an engineer, he's he's um, also an inventor. And uh, apparently inventing required a uh, 3D printer. And it's been an absolute joy for for him, for the products that he invents and uh, he, he puts out into the market. But it's been very useful for embroidery. Um, because I wanted to make my embroidery become stand up and come off the cloth, he's been able to, I, I literally give him a mud sketch of what I'd like and he can print various things that can allow begin the basis of rather than having it on fabric gives me a solid basis to work on um, and uh, they're fabulous for for small installations as well so and you can print them in all sorts of colors and it you know takes overnight and I've got something to trial and use um, so it's been very useful engineers do have their plate <laughs> yes they do well it, it's it's nice that we we have such differing lives I mean we at, because you get together and we've both been working on such different things so it certainly gives us plenty to talk about when we meet in the evenings but he he has his own studio where he's uh, writing software and things and talking to other engineers and learning I mean I, I think the lovely thing about both of us is we are in the second half of our life and we're both very keen to continue learning and um, 
during COVID, he wandered out one day and said he'd got a degree in software. <laughs> yeah. It was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> he worked on it for half a year and did it through a, an American site and uh, he needed to learn some new software and got himself a degree. <laughs> Okay, that's one of maybe three people who I know or have, uh, have been encounter have encountered who actually used the pandemic time to advantage. Okay. <laughs> yes, and, and that's very true. I we often I often joke that when my granddaughter asks me, "What did I do during the lockdown?" and we had a very very long lockdown in Australia, uh, I can say that I wrote a book, and I think that that's nice. I'm I. I, th I think the first couple of weeks I was curled up in a corner worrying ourself, myself sick and decided that was very unhealthy. So the book had been germinating in the back of my mind for a long time and this gave me the opportunity. It gave me time and it gave me space because no one was knocking at the door or, or ringing and it gave me the opportunity to write down the process, which was fabulous. It, 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 and many artists in Australia certainly say that the lockdown was the best time for them because they weren't disturbed by preparing for exhibitions and teaching and they actually produce some of their best work. Yeah. I've, I've thought from time to time, we need to gather some artists of all kinds and see if, if the pandemic wasn't the, kind of a, uh, an ugly way to get a good godsend of, uh, m you know, mental freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, certainly the artists that I know and speak with, the majority of them said that they, they quietly whispered because you feel you shouldn't say that you enjoyed the pandemic. Of course, it was right. it was horrifying, but uh, for them, it was definitely about giving yourself time. And isn't there a lesson in that? We're so so busy. Certainly during my working working life, when we were running a company, the hours were so long that we never gave ourselves the luxury of of, of time. And I think you almost, if if you're listening to this and you you have a busy life and you have children. You almost need to diarise that time and give it to you because you you deserve it. You deserve to have a half an hour to sit by yourself and to be in another zone. And it's really it's just a to in some ways it's a form of breathing um, and getting your blood pressure down as well. So there are health issues which are well documented in any of this type of thing, where you're concentrating on this and and it's as if the world around you disappears because you're concentrating on the stitch and the colour and the thinking about that process in front of you rather than all the other worries outside and, and within the family and in the job and so on. So it, I think it's wonderful for, for good health. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, we're seeing that and that's going to be an interesting fallout uh, from the pandemic is what people do with that knowledge, that quality of life, that balance of life knowledge, um, because we're see, I think we're seeing it all over the place. We're certainly in in the work work world where people you know returning to the office. No, I don't want to. I no, I I can get my work done at home and and uh, go see the kids' activities at school, and it's a much better situation. And um, yeah, there's a mental uh, mental improvement I think that that comes out of that. Uh, that again, you know, a pandemic's an ugly way to get to it, but um, I think it's really opened some minds. I, I agree. I think the pandemic was one of the most tragic things to happen to the world. And if you like any death, and in this case, it was millions of deaths, if you can't have a lesson from that, and whatever that lesson is, it'll be a personal lesson on where you go and how you decide to manage your life, it would be a great shame. And I there, there, I have a number of friends who've not just said, uh, I want to work from home. They've actually said, you know what, I don't like my job and no. I'm going to change. And that's pretty profound. But surely if you, if, uh, if you don't like something, there's a time, the only person who can recognise it is yourself and then the only person who can do something about it is yourself as well. Um, I was very lucky that uh, we had left our business and I was able to concentrate on something as healthy as this. Yeah. I want to get back to the, to the drawing thing and the, I can't draw and the, and the, you know, the fear of the blank page. Cause it, I, I'm definitely one of those, I can't draw people, you know, stick figures and they're terrible uh, in their own right. But uh, <laughs> what Beth, it was like a year ago that you had a run there where you were doing some drawing every day and, right. And 
I I enjoyed watching that because I felt you progressing. And right. was it was that what did that do to you? Yeah, I think that uh, I made that made, made I made the mistake of posting it on Instagram. And that's why I think I stopped because it never felt like it was good enough. Um, but I, I do think doing, I think you recommend just doing a few minutes of drawing every day and it does something to your brain. It, it kind of, you start looking at things different in a different way. Absolutely. I, I think you start to, um, like all artists, you begin to notice smaller details. And I, I, I think too, that maybe people try to look too big instead of, looking at one detail, let's, let's say, for example, um, you want to draw a car and that's a fairly large structure to draw and can be overwhelming. Well, in my book, uh, what I did was <laughs> we, were, we were wandering around a, um, a car lot and because I'm an artist, I mean, honestly, I, I wouldn't even be able to tell you what kind of car we drive, but I did notice <laughs> that the uh, we call them hubcaps. I presume they're this maybe have the same name in America. Yep. Uh, hubcaps are different on every single car, even, even in the same dealerships. And it was a sunny day and they were shiny and I'm attracted to shiny things. So I took some photos and went home and started to just drop the hubcaps. And then from there, I felt that there was something to do with flowers as well. If you started to curve some of the lines and from that, a whole lot of embroidery came. So uh, that was the first thing that I did. Maybe just take something simple. And also, I think, Beth, one of the things you can do is pick something you really like to do, whatever that topic is, and just keep repeating it because each time you do it, it will change and will get better and you can critique. Keep it in a, in a journal page by page and look at your progress. I mean, if you look at any textbooks by Van Gogh and look at the first drawings that he did or the first paintings he did, which he would send to his brother, they were awful. And now look at the guy. He's famous because he does <laughs> such good stuff. So, And that, the other, the other uh, technique that I use, um, which I learnt from an, another teacher who uh, gave a lecture at university, was tracing. And... People seem to have this thought that tracing is cheating. It's so not. Because, again, Beth, if you trace something and it's in your journal and it's at home, it's not cheating. You're not breaking any copyright. But what you are doing is getting your hand and your eyes coordinated. And that allows this brain exercise or brain memory to happen. And each time if you chose uh, a drawing and you traced it and then you traced it again and you traced it again, you start to get a memory in your brain. Then you take away the tracing and you copy it onto a piece of paper rather than tracing. Do that a few times and I guarantee you that after a few hours of doing that exercise, you will begin to draw that thing in your own technique. You'll loosen up, you'll change it and you'll make it your own. And so I think tracing and copying are an important part of drawing if you don't want to just go freehand. It gives you a starting point uh, to get going. And, of course, if I think you, we're all painfully aware of copyright, but if it's in a journal that you're not sharing, then I don't think there's an issue with that. And if you trace it and then you draw it yourself, then it becomes your own. So you're not breaking copyright, in my opinion. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> no, I, th I think you're fine there. See, that's interesting, Beth, that you said that, that you, your mistake was was posting the pictures because that's what we're talking about here in, in improv embroidery is just keep it to yourself. Just enjoy it for your own benefit. And so, so do you, Beth, do you think that if you had not posted it, you would have continued drawing that it kind of made you yeah. nervous about it? it it, it, it got it got the whole um, fear um, um, critique, uh, not critique, uh, criticize um, thing going in my head. Oh, this isn't good enough. Why are you bothering? You're you're wasting paper. You're wasting time. It's it's kind of we all have that little voice in our head when we're working on something new or something we don't feel we're good at that comes in and and kind of sabotages us. Um, don't you think, Carol? I mean, absolutely. I, I, but I also think there's something about social media, and and I'm not of the age of social media, although it's another it's another um, 
thing that I've had to adopt because of the book. But you're looking for acknowledgement and you're looking for someone to say, oh, I like that with a tick of that little heart or they make a comment. Oh, I love what you're doing. People who are beginning in their drawing or their embroidery may not get that. And I think we have to be comfortable in our own shells and say, I like doing it. If you enjoyed doing the drawing, even if you're not comfortable with what you drew, is that not enough to say, I had half an hour where I was feeling good. I had the pencil on the paper. I enjoyed the process rather than the end result. That should be enough. And I think that's something that I tried to get across in the book. This is about the process, not necessarily the end result, because that end result will come because if you'd done that for 365 days, 10 minutes each day, you would absolutely have been able to say to yourself, look at my first drawing, that's so funny. Look at my last drawing, I have improved. And if, if your drawing isn't any good, one of the things that I like people to do is draw the stitches. Now, one of the stitches is running stitch, simple in, out, in, out. Why not draw a whole lot of dashes and dots? You've got your French stitches and your running stitches down pat. Then they can't be a mistake. And I think that's the other thing. I said to someone the other day, I love doing abstract. And she said, why? I said, because it doesn't look like anything. So no one could say, oh, it doesn't look like a person. Or a... So you cannot you cannot be open to, to um, criticism if it doesn't look like anything. So abstract's a great way to go as well. And I just, I think I just articulated that in the last six months. And it made me laugh because I thought when, when you look at my things, I'm not really aiming specifically for a picture. I'm, I may be aiming for social comment, uh, but I'm not necessarily aiming to, certainly wouldn't try a replica of a, a portrait, for example, because that's not my area of expertise. Yeah. And the, the other aspect that plays a role in this thing is is the child in us that has been shoved way down deep over the years as we grow older uh and you told us uh, in the book the story of your was it your granddaughter and the tiles that's right yeah yes that's right we she she look i'm a grandma and i'm sure every grandma can relate to this this grandchild gave me such joy she was uh the second i saw her i just fell in love with her and i knew that we would have a wonderful wonderful relationship although she's becoming a bit grown up now but <laughs> when she was when she was little she would come over for play dates with me and uh i do other things besides embroidery and i i have a great and many embroiderers do have a great passion for their garden and so i i try to do one big project in my small garden each year in the summer months and I decided to break up a whole lot of recycled tiles and create uh, a uh, mosaic at the bottom bottom section of my studio. And I invited her on one of her visits to draw on the concrete before we started to mosaic a section. She, I told her it was the theme was gardens and birds and things like that. We have a very big, uh, we have about thirty peacocks in our street streets. Um, so that was a possibility. So she did some drawings, two or three drawings, and then she was quiet. We stepped back and we quietly looked at what she'd done. I didn't say anything and we just assessed it. And I said, what do you think? And she said, I like it. And I thought, how lovely. She wasn't criticising herself. She just liked her drawing. And that to me, it's a simple lesson, but what a good lesson. Instead of going, oh, I can't stand it. I have to rub it out. I have to do it again. Be happy with what you put on there. And that drawing was then uh, filled with uh, leftover tiles from the recycling place. And uh, that's now permanently there as a record of, of her drawing. <laughs> that's terrific. That's terrific. Yeah, but that's the kid. That's the kid, uh, the child. Yeah, I like it. You, you're, you're free. Your mind is free to like it. And you're not really concerned about criticism or critique from others. That's right. And and how lovely if we could go back to that. But I think we unlearn that, don't we, as we get older yes. because others crit criticise or find negatives in us. Uh, maybe our parents do, our teachers, and, of course, other children. I think they become crueler as they get older. Um, 
but she had an open heart and an open mind. And I think that was what was absolutely lovely about that lesson. Yeah, life takes that away from us, doesn't it? It's too bad. Uh, it seems to, doesn't it? <laughs> it's just too bad, yeah. You mentioned recycled materials, and that, that also uh, carries all the way through your book. You you don't let anything go to waste. <laughs> No, you have to be careful uh, because there is a there is a very fine line between being a hoarder and being a collector. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I I'm passionate about recycling uh, fabric because the textile industry, particularly the fashion industry, has a lot to answer for in regard to our environmental um, problems. Making a piece of fabric, when you think carefully about it takes an enormous amount of resources because it needs water, it needs human labour, it needs someone to, uh, I'm talking about natural products, to grow it, to cut it, to spin it, to weave it, whatever, and then to turn it into fabric. Then it has to be designed, then it has to be made into clothing, and a lot of it ends up in India or just at the tip. Uh, denim's another one that I'm, I love embroidering because if it's pre-worn, it's so, so soft. And... I'm also keen to not make this an expensive hobby. Um, you know, you buy a tube of paint and you're up for ten or twenty dollars. Uh, you you use some a shirt that you've got in the back of your cupboard, or you go to we we have these places where you can buy secondhand clothing, and you pick up a jacket there, and you can spend a whole year embroidering a jacket if you wanted to, and it's cost you two or three dollars, and you've given that jacket some new life. Um, if 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 trousers like uh, jeans are completely worn out you can cut a piece off and just embroider that little piece off the trousers which I often do as well and some of those samples are just cut up jeans that are that have uh, apparently shrunk um, <laughs> and, uh, as I've got older so it, it doesn't you don't have to someone said to me the other day why don't you use linen and I had to ponder on that I, I never embroider on linen and there were two reasons linen can cost up to $80 a metre um, a piece of denim off, a, off some jeans cost 2 or $3 from my pocket. It's cost a lot more environmentally to make it. But it, it just, I, and I think too, I'm constantly practising and I wouldn't practise on something that was $80 a metre. I want to practise on a piece of calico and, and I like painting on, adding a bit of paint on it. And I'd hate to paint, for some reason, I'd hate to paint on um, $80 metre of stuff rather than a $2 metre of fabric. Um, and I think, too, if you spend a lot of money on your fabric, that begins to be part of that white canvas. It's so expensive, I can't do anything with it. So if it's $2, you can say, well, it doesn't matter. It's actually only $2. So let's throw some paint on it and see what happens. Well, I have to tell you a story today. Um, I actually went to an estate sale and they had tablecloth. There was one that I think it was cotton, um, but it was a hundred and four inches by 62 inches and it mm -hmm. came 12 napkins and I paid all of four dollars and I always wash those things and I bring them back from these things and I'm thinking okay is this too precious to cut up and I'm thinking no Beth this is <laughs> you know it, it's a great beginning you know it and I'm just wondering I think it, I've got the white canvas here and I think I'm just going to have to chop that baby up and maybe start just drawing on it and start stitching on it. Um, Absolutely. It, it, is, it is wonderful to, to do that because uh, my second book that I'm working on at the moment and I'm teaching people to do it, when they draw on the cloth, I'm really mean. I won't let them use a, a pen where you can iron it. You know, there's fabric pens that you can iron it away. I make them draw on it with a uh, texter. <gasps> Shocking. So they are stuck <laughs> with those lines and uh, they have to commit and they have to be comfortable with what they've put on because the joy of embroidery is if you don't like that line, you can actually cover it up with thread anyway. And if you, before you start that, that's another reason for using the paper and the pen. You need to get that flow going. You need to feel comfortable. Let's say you wanted to uh, embroider some flowers. So start drawing a whole lot of flowers. Just do it over and over again and that gives you a rhythm, and then you can take that rhythm to the cloth and start to draw on that. Um, and I haven't really talked about that in this book, but in my contemplation cloth, uh, it's two things that I did. I, I had a metre of 
well, not a meter, it's probably two meters of fabric. And I put light paint on it, I drew on it, and then I just started embroidering it. And with no plan, no desire to show it to anyone, just to keep my hands busy. Again, this was during COVID where um, I was feeling a bit stressed and that was perfect. I, I, rules are a, a strange thing, aren't they? We, we have rules when we buy a pattern, a commercial pattern. It tells you what colour to use, it tells you the type of thread, and it tells you where to put that needle and that thread. So there's nothing wrong with setting a few simple rules. And Beth, for you, the rule might be uh, I will cut it up and then I'll work on a piece that fits into my embroidery hoop, let's say 10 inches by 10 inches. And the rule might be I am going to fill this piece of cloth and I don't care how long it takes. That could be the rule. Or the rule might be I will pick these colourways and only stick to that. I don't like that rule because I like all colours except brown. But but you might decide I'm going to use every single coloured thread that I have. Another rule is I'm going to use what I've got in my cupboard and not go and buy things because we can accumulate and collect things. That, uh, I went to a craft fair this week. Boy, there was a lot of things to buy. And <laughs> I could have bought a lot of things home and put them in the cupboard and not use them. And, again, this is about – and during COVID, people must have learned that they could use what they had in their cupboard because you couldn't go shopping quite so easily. Of course, there was online shopping, but um, a lot of my friends who are textile artists just used what they had in the cupboard and they were surprised at the results they got because they picked up something they may not have used before. Yeah, think... we all have those cupboards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I don't, but... <laughs> yeah, we all do. What is it about needle and thread? I mean, obviously you have an ability uh, to draw and to express through drawing. What is it that that is about needle and thread that makes you go to that next level and stitch what you've drawn? Uh, is is there something there that helps you you feel you express your art better? Uh, yeah. If I ask it that, is interesting. if that makes any yeah. sense, I don't know. I, th I think so. I, I think the drawing was the f is the first stage, but the embroidery, really, what what I mean, even why did I take up embroidery? It, I took it up because it was so portable. And at the time that I was started at university, we were still running our company, and I had busy, busy days as well as going to university to lectures and so on. And we were um, a very small, by American standards, international company. So we were travelling across the world uh, to, to, to do with the business. And the thing that fitted into my handbag, apart from the scissors uh, due to security, was embroidery. I could... And I spent a lot of time travelling, and I think that is such a waste of time. Of course, you could read or you could watch a movie or, you, God forbid, you could be on social media, which... I mean, you could be on social media for 20 minutes and go, hang on a minute, I've achieved nothing. I've learnt <laughs> nothing. I've done nothing. And I prefer to be making and creating. So the embroidery was a very portable thing. And the drawing is part of that because I can't always stitch. Sometimes you do have to give your brain a bit of a break. Uh, but I feel that the embroidery allows me to go further because you can just keep adding stitches, whereas a drawing, you do it, and I've got a, a, a few of my journal pieces in the in the book, but once it's done, it's done, whereas the embroidery, I just think you can just keep on going with it and move across the, make the, uh, instead of paper, just have a bigger piece of cloth and just keep going. So I think that's what it is. It's portable, and there's, to me, there's more freedom. Yeah. I don't know. I think I draw with thread. There's no doubt that's what I say I do. Interestingly, uh, the piece that's on the front cover, uh, I put it, I submitted it into a number of very, very important exhibitions in Australia. They, they are well recognised. And it was accepted into two drawing prizes. So if you think about that, isn't that strange that mm. they accepted embroidery into a drawing price? Yeah. It never occurred, I don't know why, but it never occurred to me to put it into a textile exhibition. Hmm. Is that weird? Yes. And yet it was accepted by artist and curator and the judges as a piece of drawing. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's strange because usually the, the story when it comes to exhibitions and uh, and needlework is it's not art. Get it out of here. Um, yes, very yeah. old fashioned. 
and yeah. and offensive. <laughs> well, that too, yeah, yeah. But then to say, well, this is the equivalent of drawing. Let's put it here. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Because I guess from the drawing on the paper, I then take the drawing onto the fabric and I am drawing um, images. I'm drawing uh, statements. Now, I have to say, I mean, certainly during university, uh, you couldn't just make something. They wouldn't accept that as, a, as an assessment piece. And they encourage you to do pieces that made a comment on various issues of the day, mm. um, which I certainly did. I did find that very stressful. There are so many awful issues that we can make comment on, uh, and I certainly did that. But I also found it stressful because part of the process of making a political or social comment is that you research it, you get to know the subject better, and through that you then transcribe that onto you, in this case, onto the cloth. But I, as I got older, I found that so stressful, and I think that's where you can put a message on there, of course, but in, in the book you can see I just did a poem that my brother wrote on, on the where I did words. Uh, it was a poem that he'd written um, about love and it, it was a poem that resonated with me I thought it was absolutely beautiful um, and that was a much nicer thing to work on and I suppose that was also profound for me that we don't all, all have to make political comments um, we can maybe work on I like working on the topic of memory for example which is a far more positive experience <laughs> <laughs> I have fond memories of course which helps of my childhood um, and that's much better for my my inner health and being. Um, well, don't you think too? Because you don't like necessarily listen to something, you're you're actually quieting yourself. So if you're if you're trying to make a political statement within needlework while you're stitching, you're thinking about that political statement. That that kind of is more agitating. So it does the opposite effect of what maybe you want. Absolutely, absolutely. I've just submitted a piece, uh, a, what I'm going to call a three-dimensional sculptural piece of embroidery uh, into a sculpture prize. My embroidery has also been in a sculpture prize as a finalist. Uh, I've just done a piece and it's, uh, a, it's a, a small wreath, but it's also in the shape of a peace symbol and I did it in black and white and it's called Mourning for Peace, obviously because of the awful, awful situation that we have, which has affected the entire world. Um, I did it, but it stressed me out. Yeah. <laughs> it just stressed me out because when I started reading articles from think tanks about where they thought this was going, it wasn't good. So <laughs> I have finished it and I've submitted it, but um, it didn't give me peace doing that. Um, and so I was very happy to go back to the uh, work, other work that I'm doing, which is... Uh, far more calming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the things that I enjoyed, I enjoyed the book. One Thank that you. stood out for, for me, because it, it's, a, it's a project book, but it's really exercises to me, and it was the fortune cookie meditation. Uh, I actually read that a couple of times just to kind of take that in. Describe where did that idea come from? Well, I, I talked a, a, a few minutes ago about having a rule, and I think that, again, it's that blank canvas. How, how do I start that? And this was a very simple rule, and it, just, it was just fun to use the fortune cookie, um, and I think that I've seen many fortune cookies on American movies, so I know you have them. <laughs> it's not oh, such yeah. a big thing in Australia. I, I, my movies, you always got a fortune cookie when you went to a Chinese restaurant, so... <laughs> But the thought is that when you open them, there's something either very funny because the conversion to English is not very good or there could be something profound that you might relate to. And that can be your starting point for your work. So you, you get a fortune cookie and it might say, um, as soon as you feel too old to do something, do it. And that's one of the examples in the book. So you might think, you know what, that's something I'd like to ponder on, but it might be one or two words that you use as your rule. It could be too old or feel, and you might decide to just embroider the word feel. And what it is is it's a simple rule that gets you started thinking about something not necessarily political or environmental, 
uh, although they may make comments on that in, in the thing. And I always say to people, if you don't like the uh, what came out of the cookie, just open another one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, and that can just get you started thinking about an idea for, particularly if you decided to do, I mean, best tablecloth might turn into a stitch journal, for example, and she could just sew uh, a word onto each one with paper or you could embroider a word of the day, for example, and that word is something you might ponder on, uh, but it's also a way of beginning to get your technique of embroidery better on each page. No pressure, that's the main thing. <laughs> Concentrate on the pro process rather than um, rules, which you have with, of course, commercial patterns. Yeah, it's just a, a neat way to get started. It was, it was just kind of, yeah. It's, I could, I just, I just envisioned myself sitting at a table with a bag full of fortune cookies, and crumbs all over the place. <laughs> Don't like that one. Don't like that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I did have one student who said to me, "Oh, I'm gluten free," and I said. You don't have to eat them. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> Just get the fortune. <laughs> but you can also see from that chapter that I did do some drawings. Um, I, and those drawings came from me. I've been to an art gallery. I wandered into our what we call our Chinatown to get some food because our Asian food here in, in Australia is just sublime. And there was a whole lot of, you can see I photographed sort of like an envelope that the, the um chopsticks came in there was a variety of uh images on the walls that the this particular restaurant had and I started drawing them but I broke them down into something much simpler and from that I did a very sort of uh rough embroidery of some of those images and and really made them relatively abstract because so you could basically see it it's Chinese because or, chi or has an Asian feel because it has the red background and the gold front uh, but in that particular embroidery things look as if they're falling apart a little bit um, so maybe there's a very quiet comment in that in that <laughs> particular embroidery on the on this feature page yeah it's a very subtle comment yeah <laughs> Well, it's a terrific book, uh, and I really enjoyed it, and it, it's just so different. It really, it, it was one of those that got my wheels spinning. I'm sure it did for Beth, too. Just uh, paused many times just to think through what you were sharing with us. Well, thank you. I, I, I hope that there's some messages in there. I have to say that the feedback that I've got from uh, online from people who have written reviews, I, I, I have a tear in my eye because I think I finally found what it is, my voice, and I think I'm helping people to find their voice as well and to be healthy mentally through something as simple as embroidery. And the the feedback that I get and the repeat sales I'm getting from various, uh, because I'm self-published, this goes mostly to independent book sales uh, or directly. And uh, the feedback has been absolutely wonderful. So I haven't had anything negative on social media, which has been very good. <laughs> Yay for that, yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed. So then on top of that, then we have uh, teaching, uh, What uh, teaching, exhibiting. What uh, what are you doing otherwise uh, other than writing books? Well, I, I absolutely first and foremost consider myself to be a full-time artist and I guess people kind of say, what is that? I'm, because I come from a my last decade was a business where you had to be pretty regimented on how you ran your day, I am actually quite faithful to that title of full-time artist. Once I'm up, the dog's been walked, been to the gym, and you have to do that because I spend far too much time sitting on my <laughs> bum doing embroidery, and it's not from that point of view, it's not healthy. But I am in the studio uh, for the full day, um, and that is my first and foremost thing that I do. And I'm not there specifically to write a book. I'm there to embroider and to think about that. The teaching comes because people call me. I, I don't proactively look for teaching jobs, but people, because they hear about it through a number of groups that I'm in and I'm invited to come and teach, so I take up those opportunities when I can. Um, I guess exhibiting, in order to keep myself fresh and be out there, I try to exhibit I mean, that kind of fell away during COVID because there were no exhibits. Right. Um, 
and maybe I got out of the habit. So I don't generally make things to exhibit, but I do make things. And then when an opportunity comes by, I look at the pieces that I have and see if they'll fit into that particular uh, brief because sometimes there's sizing issues or, or whatever and see if it fits into that particular topic. So I'm not trying to make things to exhibit 100 times a year. It's, that to me is stress as well. If you make something specifically for an exhibit, you begin to stress out because you've got a particular theme, you've got a particular deadline, and that stress just isn't where, where I want to be now. So I make things and then I look at what's there and see what might work in an exhibit. Yeah. A full day as, a, as an artist, what, what, is mm -hmm. that, what is that like? Is, it, is there a structure to it? Do you just, as the spirit leads you... Uh, how do you go yeah. about that? Because well, I, I, I can't even I can't even comprehend that. <laughs> well, it's very cold at here at the moment, so um, it's disgracefully cold for Australia. So the first thing I do is turn on the heat, <laughs> <laughs> and then I sit at the desk. I may look at notes that I've done the day before. I have a, a, a work board, I guess, where things are hanging up. Uh, so usually when I'm working on a piece before I leave the studio, I hang it up so I can come back, sit from a distance and have a look at it and see where I'm up to. Um, and if I'm not sure where I'm going, which can happen, <laughs> I have a number of pieces of fabric that I just embroider. Um, I'll stop for a quick lunch and if the sun is shining, I have a sunny spot in the studio, I will also read other artists' books because, of course, we can always learn from other books. And part of this book came about by reading other books and it felt to me that there was a very specific formula going through a publisher, I guess, and that was to talk a bit at the beginning, show some pretty pictures and then have your patterns at the back. And I felt that there was a massive gap in the market. So my, my background is sales and marketing and I did feel there was a gap in this type of idea. Um, and so that was also something I thought about when I'm working. But I am stitching until probably 4.30, 5 o'clock. It's usually time for a cup of tea by then and uh, come upstairs and uh, get acquainted with my husband again, <laughs> who's also been in the studio. We're both so passionate about what we're doing that the day goes so quickly. And I don't take my phone down there. Now, I, it stays upstairs and... Um, you know, my mother will say, oh, you didn't answer the phone. I'll say, well, I'm working. So that's that's where I'm at. I'm really, I consider this to be my day and I don't take the phone. I, I obviously record pieces for um, just so I can see the progress. And sometimes if you're working on a piece and you photograph it, it looks different in the camera. I don't know why there's something about that. And you can also pick up areas that need improving or need colour changes or whatever. Um, but I'm not distracted by the phone or music or I just have my notebooks and, and the, all the bits and bobs that I need, which is not a lot really. It's just some embroidery thread. Now, see, now, Beth, she's given me an idea here. Maybe I, uh -oh. need, to, I need to turn off the email. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because when you when you think about it you, you you get on the phone generally people do it I mean we go to the gym most days in the morning and we do a, a good hour but we don't take our phone and we sit there watching these people I don't know maybe they're there for an hour but they're not doing an hour's exercise because they're either photographing themselves or they're I don't know what they're doing but they've got their phone with them so they're not in the moment of exercising and I can't say I love it, but I think it's very important because I intend to live to I'm 100 and I need to be healthy. <laughs> and it's it, it, it's the phone is such a distraction. And and if you get caught up in, I don't know what people watch, YouTube or whatever, what a waste of time. Do you benefit from any of that? So I think you have to be quite strict with yourself and say, I'm going to do this and I'm turning off all that social media stuff, the phone, Um I even unplug the doorbell sometimes, which is pretty rude, isn't it? <laughs> so leave it on the door, whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. Because because I'm passionate about it and, and I don't want to be distracted because that distraction means you come upstairs, suddenly you're having a coffee, then you're chatting to someone and um, the day just can pass without you actually yeah. 
uh, doing something. Now, I do read a lot. I'm a very passionate reader, apart from textbooks, particularly during COVID. It was a wonderful, wonderful time to read. Um, got through lots and lots of terrific books. and But those books also can give you some fantastic ideas because if you think about all the words that are used for um, for uh, textiles and fibre, uh, it is quite amazing uh, how people use those words. Mm-hmm. And that's really interesting. I just finished reading a book called The Finch and it was surprising how the author used quite a number of sentences that were describing a person or a situation, but she was using a, a word to do with textiles. So I was writing those down and I just thought they were wonderful words to ponder on instead of pondering on um, a social issue, I could ponder on a sentence that an author's written and written it far better than I could. So, yeah, reading's a, a, an important part of my day. If I get tired, I did actually did accidentally break my uh, hand about Ouch. six weeks ago, yeah, and it it um, does ache a bit in the afternoon. So I'm, I, the sort of eight hours of embroidery at the moment isn't quite <laughs> where I'm up to. <laughs> so it cramps up a bit. Now I have to go back and look at the Finch. I tried to read that. I couldn't. I just couldn't. Um, it's a, it's a very uh, depth. It has a lot of uh, words in it, as in it was painful. It, like, <laughs> it was painful. It, no, no. It, it, well, I like that. I like descriptions, and it it was very wordy. But I like that. Instead of just saying he ate breakfast, it goes into more detail, and that's just the kind of book I like. And yeah. and the storyline itself was really – it was a tragic story, a boy who was just not cared for and yeah. how he managed on his own, really. It was very sad from that point of view, but uh, he had to manage on his own, and I thought it was terrific. But you've got to be in the right zone for some books, don't you? Yeah, you do, and I was not in the zone for that one. It was like, can we get on with the story, please? <laughs> Yeah, and finally I just said I don't care about the story anymore and shut the door. <laughs> that was and, it. And you know what? Life is too short. If you're not enjoying the book, you should absolutely close it and hand it on to someone else. Yeah. And that's and, what uh, I do. And try another yep. one. Yep. Good. I, I, feel, I feel no <laughs> obligation to finish a book if I don't enjoy it. Nope. Absolutely. Nope. Absolutely. <laughs> but now, I, now I'm curious about the textile things. I don't think I'm curious enough to go back to it, but I'm curious. <laughs> But, but you should you should be aware of that when you are reading because it's surprising how many times um, a word to do with textiles is spun into a sentence. Yeah. All right, maybe so, I'll go skim it a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm reading a John Grisham at the moment, and even he used, he said the fibre of the, of the day was or something, and I went, oh, there you go, John, good on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Light reading, but a bit of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Carol, this has been an absolute treat. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Wow, so much to think about. Well, thank you so much. It's 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 a it's a very simple message of giving yourself time and and uh, being kind to yourself uh, with just a little bit of fabric and a, and a few pieces of thread. And I hope some people can pick up that idea and just say, "I like what I did." And thank you so much, both of you, Gary and Beth, for your time. This is my second podcast and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'm learning all the time with this. A book uh, opens you to all sorts of opportunities and I'm saying yes to everything as I get older except bungee jumping. So thank you both for your time. (laughs) All right. Thanks. And thanks to everybody for listening. 